So what I was going to talk about is prostate cancer and inherited risk. And part of what we're going to run through is exactly what is cancer, why does it sometimes run in families, um, and how do we work that out. Talk a little bit about the genes um, and what a genetic test actually involves. Um, also, I often find, particularly with some of my male patients, it's always about why do I need counselling. It's not that kind of counselling. Um, what sort of research is available and where to from here. So the first thing to say is when I speak to patients, I talk about what a normal cell is. And I think it helps to understand genetics and how things go wrong to understand what a normal cell is. So a normal cell, I think, is like an adult. It knows what the rules are and generally speaking, follows those rules. I've got a 13 year old. I'm hoping she's doing her homework and then going to watch MasterChef, but who knows? Some adolescents collect a lot of changes. Now, these could be ear piercings or tattoos, clothing choices, hairstyles. They're not things that they inherited from you and they're not things that they pass on. That's the same as these pre-cancer changes, changes that have just occurred in that cell. We call them somatic genetic changes to differentiate them from the kind that are in inherited. Now hopefully, like my daughter, if you've got kids, they turned out okay. And most of these pre-cancer cells don't actually become cancer, but some do. And these are the delinquents. They grow when they shouldn't, they don't die when they should, and they stop following the rules. And that's what cancer is. That's in part because they've collected so many of these genetic changes. But we have our immune system, our police force, that can get rid of these cells. But like the real police force, it's just not perfect. Another way that you might hear genes described is as books in a library. And in this sense, the genes are in our chromosomes. Those are the shelves in the library. And each time a cell makes a copy of itself, that's how our cells divide and grow, it has to make a complete copy of this library. That's nine billion letters of code. If I was to type it out just once, it would take me two or three years. And although I'm a reasonably good typist, I'd make a lot of mistakes. And it's the same with our cells. They make mistakes, spelling mistakes, bits get added in or left out. But we have our spell checkers, grammar checkers, quality assurance measures, and even a backup you might think of something like doing a photocopy. If you photocopy a photocopy and then photocopy it again, after a certain number of photocopies, you're not going to be able to read that. So our cells have built-in mechanisms that simply say, no, that's enough copies. You're not allowed to do any more. Cancer is a bit like a vandalized library. Books are out of place, chapters are missing, kids' books in the adult section, everything's just a bit chaotic. But it's important to realise that just one spelling mistake is almost never enough to cause a cancer. So why does cancer run in families? Well, the idea of inheriting a mutation, a gene with a mistake in it, that then causes cancer, is actually really rare in real life. Most cancer that runs in families is actually because you have great genes, genes that mean that you're living to an older age, allowing these genetic mistakes to build up in the cells themselves, those somatic changes. We also have gene-gene interactions. Probably the easiest way to think of that is in terms of what we call modifier genes. And this is not clinically happening yet, but I think in the next three or five years it will be. So some families might just have a bit more prostate cancer or maybe it's just a bit younger or all the brothers seem to have been affected, but they're all in their 60s or 70s. These could be modifier genes. Each gene by itself doesn't really increase your risk by very much at all, point something of a percent. But some families might actually inherit five or ten of these, and they tend to interact with each other in your environment. If you think of some friends or families that you might know that drink, smoke, seem to do everything wrong and still live to be a hundred, they've got the good version of the modifier genes along with a bit of luck. Mm -hmm. The other kind of things that you can think about 
are gene and environment interactions. If you've got a Celtic background with blue eyes, pale skin, blonde hair, that kind of um, skin pattern, chances are you're going to be more prone to melanoma in Australia. So that's still genes and environment, a very common example. But mainly it's things like diet and exercise, your lifestyle changes, and I'll talk a bit about those, but most of it is simply those cells building up mistakes over time. If you end up with a cancer, it's probably because you didn't die of an infection as a baby, you didn't die a violent death in your 20s, a heart attack in your 40s, diabetes in your 50s. So how do we know when things could be running in a family? Sometimes we get some clues. We call it a phenotype. Some of the, the um, high-risk cancer genes go with things like a large head and a low IQ, or maybe freckles on the lips and inside the mouth and a funny kind of polyp in the bowel. That's probably not your story or your family story. Most of these cancer uh, genes or high-risk cancer genes don't have an outward look. So we require other information, family history for example, um, how old people were, how many cancers have occurred, that sort of thing, as well as how many people didn't get cancer. If you're one of 12 kids, chances are there'll be more cancer in your family than somebody that's one of one or two. We can also do some testing of the cancer. Now in uh, this way of getting clues, I'll talk a little bit about Lynch syndrome, which has been discussed in the setting of prostate cancer, although it's not really a big cause of prostate cancer. So what are these clues and how do we recognize them? Um, this is one of my favorite slides, so some of you may have seen it before. Just because there seems to be a pattern, shrinking women's underwear, doesn't mean that there is a link, increased temperatures. So how do we actually look for these links? We do something called a pedigree. So there's a family history questionnaire on our website, the Sydney Cancer Genetics website, and you can download that, fill it out, give it to your friends, whatever. And what we do with that information is draw out a pedigree. Girls are curvy, they get to be circles, boys are squares. Now, for some reason, people seem to think you inherit prostate cancer risk genes from your dad and breast cancer risk genes from your mum. But you'd know you get half your genes from your mum comes over in the egg and half your genes from your dad comes over in the sperm. So you get two copies of every gene. Well, if you're a woman, you get two copies of every gene. If you're a man, you get two copies of every gene except the X and the Y. So when people look at family histories, often I'm only ever told the mum's side. And a family story like this is not a high risk family. Breast cancer, the average age is uh, around 60. The risk starts to go up in the 50s. That's when we start our screening. But in fact, if you look at prostate cancer, so dad's prostate cancer at 66, it's about average too. The average age is around 67. And if you look at people by age group, about 6% will get a prostate cancer by age 65. But if you live to be 85, there's a 25% chance. And that's what we were talking about before. One of the biggest risk factors tends to be living one of those long, healthy lives. In terms of your risk of dying from a prostate cancer, it's not that great, 4%, which is actually relatively small compared to some of the other cancers that I deal with. Um, but at the same time, it's a fairly large proportion of all the cancers that men are diagnosed with. So at the point that you're doing a family tree, it's important to get dad's side of the story. Now in this particular family, you can see there's a couple of breast cancers. On the surface, that's not particularly concerning. That's about what we would expect. Almost one person in each generation. There's about a 10 to 15% chance of getting breast cancer if you're a woman. Cervical cancer, you might know that this is caused by a virus and then we have a vaccine for that now. But prostate cancer at 48, that's pretty young. That sets off alarm bells for me. The other part of my job is to actually try and track down and confirm some of these cancers. And there's a very big difference when it comes to genetics between a woman's cancer, whether it's a uterine cancer, a cervical cancer, or an ovarian cancer. In fact, we, genetic, we offer genetic testing in the public system even, 
um, to all women, all women diagnosed with ovarian cancer at 70 or under. So if there's ovarian cancer in a family, that family should be seen. So this is actually um, a higher risk family. We're not sure yet, but it's certainly ringing some alarm bells for me. So what actually is familial prostate cancer? It basically just means there seems to be more in the family than we think. It seems to be running in the family. When we do our genetic testing though, we only find a very small amount is due to the genes that you might have heard of, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now you can say BRCA or you can say BRCA. It simply stands for breast cancer 1 and breast cancer 2. But they are linked to other cancers as I'll discuss. Discuss, sorry, discussed, dear. There are some other genes that we're discovering, um, but most of our familial risk, people who say, gosh, you know, it seems like my brother and my uncle, we've all had prostate cancer, we're not able to explain why that occurs at the moment. In terms of how many prostate cancers, this is a little bit old data, which is why I put it up. We used to say that 2% of prostate cancer diagnosed under 55 was due to a BRCA2 mutation. As genetic testing has become cheaper, we've done a lot more of it. There was a study published about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now, that looked at metastatic prostate cancer. So cancer that was behaving a little bit more aggressively, or quite a lot more aggressively actually, um, than the sort of um, prostate cancer that we usually see. And when they looked at the genes in those people, they found about 10% carried a mutation in one of these high risk genes like BRCA2. So it's quite different depending on the age and whether or not that prostate cancer is behaving differently. So why do we care? If you've got a cancer, they've removed that cancer, treated it, it's gone, why would you care? Well, if it is due to an inherited mutation, it means by definition that there are other family members potentially at risk. What is the risk? In terms of prostate cancers, we said it's not a high risk, 6% is the population. With BRCA1 or BRCA2, it goes up. So it's about 15%, so nearly three, four times. At that sort of level, we're talking to age 70. As we mentioned, as you get older, the risk goes up higher. If you look at the population-based risks, I mentioned that breast cancer in women's about 10%. Ovarian cancer is not common. It's only about 1%. But things change quite a lot if there's a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So although the mistake, the mutation, can come from dad's side, we often don't see the cancers. The risk for um, men of breast cancer has gone up really very much in the case of BRCA1 and BRCA2 but it's still very low. We don't often see the breast cancer, even when there's a mutation there. Perhaps more concerning is the ovarian cancer risk. We don't have good screening, and I'll mention that in a moment. So what do we actually do? If you do a genetic test and somebody says, ah, there's a mistake, a mutation in one copy of your BRCA2 gene, well, what do we do differently? In terms of the prostate, it's still being sorted out. Do we start screening? At what age? What are we going to do? Currently the recommendation is to start around age 40 with a PSA. I think in the next three to five years we might even be using MRIs in people who are at high risk, but we're not there yet. We know what to do for the women. For the women we start either with a risk-reducing mastectomy, that's what Angelina chose, or extra screening, including a breast MRI, and that screening starts at age 30. So for people with um, daughters, this is often more of an issue compared to um, their sons. And I mentioned the ovaries, I'll come back to that. We remove the tube and ovary, and there's no test at the end of this. You don't have to remember risk-reducing salpingo oophorectomy, but basically you need to remove the tube and the ovary at the time the risk approaches 1%. That's about 40 for a BRCA1 mutation, although we do actually discuss it from age 35, and that's got implications for when women might be thinking about having their kids, and around 45 for BRCA2. So why do we remove the tube, the fallopian tube? 
Well, despite its name, most ovarian cancer actually tends to start in the fallopian tube. And that's why it's such a problem. It's not like a breast cancer or a prostate cancer that tends to grow as an isolated thing, maybe get bigger, possibly spread. This is something that can be shed, the cells can be shed when it's microscopic. We can't see it with an ultrasound, we can't pick it up with a blood test. At the time we know there's a problem, it's often quite well established, and even when the surgeon goes in to try and get rid of it all, she can't always see where it all is. So it's much harder to treat. Now, male menopause. Um, for those of you who um, have taken uh, androgen blocking medication, it's probably a bit closer to the female menopause. Um, but in terms of these things, we don't want to remove the tubes and ovaries unless we have to. So there's very few genes that really increase ovarian cancer risk in a big way that means that we need to remove the tubes and ovaries before menopause. The study that they did that I mentioned where they looked at people who had advanced prostate cancer and they looked at their genes, they found that there was also an, um, a reasonable number of people who had this thing called Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome increases ovarian cancer and colon cancer risk as well as uterine cancer. We don't think it really increases prostate cancer risk, but you can see the same changes in the tissue taken from the prostate. And that's why this, this study mentioned it. The other reason for mentioning uh, colon cancer risk is it's one of the other high risk cancers affecting men. So some people have had a colon cancer and a prostate cancer. So it's the same story. When you're doing the family history, you look at mum's side and dad's side, and you want to look at all the different cancers. Again, the idea here is to get all of the types of cancers, uh, make sure that you know exactly what you're looking at. And again, it tends to be those young onset cancers that are the real trigger for doing genetic testing. But here we have a sneaky trick. Here we can actually do a staining test on the tumour itself. It should be done routinely, but it isn't always. And so in some cases we go back and ask for that staining test to be done on the stored sample. Basically, if the gene isn't working, then there'll be loss of the protein that that gene makes in the cancer. And that's what this staining test is. On the left-hand side, that is actually a colon cancer and all those dark cells are colon cancer cells, but the protein's made. On the other side, there's loss of staining. And that's a hint that this could be due to Lynch syndrome. And that's the test they did in that big study. And they found that there were a lot of men with prostate cancer who didn't realise that they had a family history for colon cancer and were actually at risk, as were their brothers and sisters, possibly their mums and dads, and also their children. So what is Lynch syndrome? It's due to a mistake in what's called a mismatch repair gene. And again, you don't have to remember these and they don't have any fun acronym that is part of their name. But they do increase risk to about 40% in men and 30% in women, unless you do screening. And as I mentioned, there's an increased risk of both uterine and ovarian cancer, as well as a few other things. So what do we do? Well, in this case, we actually start our screening at age 25, because if we can do a colonoscopy, see a polyp or even an early, early cancer, we can get rid of it before it causes problems. The thing, as we already mentioned, is that the screening doesn't work for ovarian cancer, and with the uterus, we tend to remove that after the woman's finished her children around age 40. Okay. Enough of these syndromes. Some things should be pretty obvious. And I think one of the things that's often missed out is diet, exercise, and a healthy body weight. The reason that diet works is it protects the cells. They simply make fewer copying errors when they divide. 
exercise switches on a lot of these protective genes and a healthy body weight you'd know that this can increase all sorts of problems it seems to increase a sort of inflammatory state and the cells just don't work as well so we can show on population based studies that you can decrease your cancer risk by one third now some of you in the audience might be sitting there thinking hang on a sec I did all of that and it's quite possible you may have made way fewer mistakes than somebody else but where those mistakes land in that library of genes is completely random. Now, if only losing weight was this easy, how to burn 800 calories in just 30 minutes. Makes me hungry even looking at a burnt pizza at this time of night. So what actually do I mean by these mistakes? So our genetic code is actually in groups of three and you might know that they're made up of A's, T's, C's and G's. I can think of anything in groups of three, so I used groups of four. Here's my recipe, beat eggs well, then cook. Maybe I'm making a cake, maybe I'm making an omelette. If I'm writing that out over and over and over, and I leave out one letter, the whole recipe won't work. We call that a frame shift mutation and it nearly always causes problems. What if I make the kind of spelling mistake that changes the code, just one word? Well, beat cats well then cook, that's not going to be a very good cake either. So sometimes these missense mutations can also be very strongly associated with disease. We also have code for punctuation. So if I change my code and I end up with a full stop, that's not going to make a good cake either. And then there are more subtle changes. Does it really matter the size of the egg? Well, yeah, probably, unless it's just scrambled eggs you're making. So with these errors, the reason I show you this is that we can now do a lot more genetic testing than we used to be able to do. And you might think, well, that's fantastic. I'll have 300 genes tested now instead of just two. The problem is the more genes you test, the more of these funny little changes that nobody's ever seen before pick up. So if you get to the end of your omelette, beat eggs well, and it says add a bit of parsley, does that matter? And what are you going to do with that result? Are you now going to worry that you've got a mistake in the gene that causes freckles on your lips and inside your mouth and a funny kind of polyp? What are you going to do with that information? What is the insurer going to do with that information? So generally, even though we can do a lot of genetic testing, we tend to keep it simple and focus on the genes that we're interested in. Talking about the mistakes, one of the ways that I explain it in the clinic is that when a cell divides and it's copying out all of that um, information, if a mistake is not fixed and it lands on a really important gene, a gene that tells that cell when to grow, it's going to grow when it shouldn't. That's still not cancer. It could be a polyp in your bowel, a lump or a bump, but it's not a cancer. But if that same cell in the prostate dividing and growing makes another mistake, this time, this point um, in a gene that tells that cell when to die, a cancer protection gene, a spell checker gene, eventually you'll end up with a cell that grows when it shouldn't, doesn't die when it should, and stops following the rules. And that's what cancer is. But that's why most cancer occurs at an older age. Most prostate cancer has nothing to do with the genes that you inherited from your mum or your dad. But some does. In the case of BRCA1 and BRCA2, probably the best known high-risk prostate cancer genes, you get one from mum, comes over in the egg, and one from dad, comes over in the sperm. So if you inherit a mutation, a spelling mistake, it's there from when you're one cell big. As you go from one cell to however many trillions of cells we are, it ends up being copied over and over. So it's in every cell of your body. That's why most genetic testing just needs the white cells because they've got the DNA. You don't have to go looking in the prostate or anywhere else. In the case of hereditary cancers, you've still got a backup recipe. I'm just going to go back so that you can see this. You've still got a backup recipe that you got from your other parent. So if you're Angelina Jolie, she told everybody she inherited a BRCA1 mutation and that actually came from her mum, but it can come from mum or dad. That means that she got a backup recipe, a working copy of BRCA1, in this case from her dad. That recipe is working just fine and her cell can use that. So it can still make whatever that protein was. In the case of BRCA1 and BRCA2, they make a spell checker. 
it fixes a very specific kind of spelling mistake that builds up in our DNA. If you knock out that second copy, the cell will lose its spell checker. It's not as though the copying gets any worse, but the mistakes build up faster. And that's why prostate cancer under the age of 50 sets off alarm bells for me. Early onset breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and so on. Okay, so how are these mutations, these mistakes passed on? Well, if you're a man, and you can see why I'm a doctor and not an artist, at the point that you make your sperm, you divide your genes in half. So there's a 50-50 chance if you carry a mistake, and I should point out we all carry mistakes in our genes, we just don't always know about them, they may not always be important. But there's a 50-50 chance that you pass on the copy with the mistake, joins up with an egg, makes a baby, that child, when they grow up, can pass it on to their kids. But there's also a 50-50 chance that you don't inherit the mutation. It doesn't matter how many eggs or how many sperm that child makes, if you don't carry a mutation in your genes, you can't pass it on. So what about genetic testing? Genetic testing just means looking at the DNA. What did you get from mum? What did you get from dad? And as I said, we tend to concentrate just on the genes we're interested in. It's usually blood, because we get a lot of DNA that way, but you can also use saliva because that contains white cells. You look at the copy from mum, the copy from dad, and you're looking for one of those spelling errors or a big chunk missing. If you find it, that's actually when things get simple. You can then do a predictive test in other relatives. You know where to look which book, which chapter, which page, and the mistake is either there or it's not. So how do we decide who gets a test? Well, we have lots of calculators and other ways of looking at it. Prostate cancer doesn't score high on any of these. So it's actually very hard to get a publicly funded genetic test unless there's ovarian cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, or uterine cancer in your family. But the thing about genetic testing is it's got a lot cheaper. Many years ago, when it was $1,650, I had one woman who said, oh, well, that's just a pair of shoes. I don't know about you guys and your shoes, but even $450 is still uh, quite a bit of money. So with the, BRCA, yeah, with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, we can test them now for uh, $425. There's even a panel called the Breast, Ovarian, Prostate and Pancreas Panel. We're not all that inventive in the area of genetics. And that costs $1,600. The other thing that's new is we can now test the prostate cancer itself. Now you can see that's much more expensive, $2,600. It used to be about $10,000. So the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, most of the time we don't need to. The time that we would do that is if the cancer um, has come back, if it's very aggressive, or if we just don't even know where this particular cancer started from, that's when we want to test that cancer and its genes. And we're basically saying, what's your weakness? What we know about breast cancer and to a degree prostate cancer is that they tend to follow a certain pathway, whereas lung cancers tend to be all over the place. So this kind of testing is not commonly done in prostate cancer, but it can be. And I'll come back to why. There's a lot of research in this area and it's ongoing. There's a, and this is where the uh, clever little acronyms come in, there's a uh, study going on at the moment, it's an international study called Practical. And what they're doing is they're looking for these modifier genes, areas of our genes that seem to increase your risk of prostate cancer. We don't really know exactly what it is or where it is and how it behaves just yet. We found a new gene that does, in, well, we haven't found a new gene, the gene was always there, but we've now given it a name, and it's called the Hox B13. It's currently very rare, mainly because we haven't really been looking for it, but it does have a significant increase in prostate cancer risk, and it's included on that prostate panel that I mentioned. So how do you find out about research? 
The Cancer Genetics Fund is a charity and I am an unpaid director. They asked me to help set up some of their stuff for them. Um, and with that, there is um, a link to the website and also an app if you're an app person. And you can simply put in prostate cancer and you'll find all of the genetic trials that are available. Most of these are discovery trials. Unfortunately, you have to be a bit unusual to get into trials. So if there's two um, prostate cancers both diagnosed at 70, they may not be all that interested. If there's a couple at 50, they might get a lot more excited. But there are trials out there and they certainly are enrolling uh, people trying to work out what causes prostate cancer um, and what can we do about reducing the risk. So when should somebody come and see me? Well, the rule of thumb is three relatives, two generations, one under 50, or some of those other characteristics that we spoke about, or a rare type of cancer. So just to summarize, all cancers genetic. Most is not caused by a gene that you inherit, a gene that you can pass on that has a mistake in it, but some is. And in those families, the genetic testing is very powerful. Not only can it tell us who's at risk and help with screening, it can also tell us who's not at risk, who goes back to being average. And sometimes it can even increase treatments. I mentioned that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are spell checker genes, and there is some information on our website about this, but spell checker genes are important for a cell to fix the mistakes that build up. If you've shut down your BRCA pathway, the cell actually uses a completely different pathway called the PARP pathway. We've now got a medication that can shut that down. Now you've got a cell that hasn't got a spell checker or a grammar checker, and basically it builds up so many mistakes that it dies. So it's very useful in advanced or metastatic cancer. It's funded in ovarian, it's been shown to work in prostate and also in breast cancer, but it's not funded. And the way that it works is that if you block that PARP pathway in a healthy cell, it's got one copy that's damaged of BRCA1 or BRCA2 if that's what you've inherited. But as I mentioned, the second copy is not damaged. And so those cells say, I don't care, I'm gonna use my PARP um, you've blocked my PARP pathway, but I'm going to use the BRCA pathway, fix my mistakes, and continue living. So that's how a PARP inhibitor works. It's called a targeted therapy because it'll only work in those cells that have lost both copies of the BRCA gene. And those sorts of targeted therapies are what a lot of this genetic research is about. The, the next thing to do is probably um, just download the family history questionnaire from our website. It's completely free. You can either complete it on your um, computer or print it out and just take it to your GP. They can have a look at it. As I said, there's certain guidelines that we use. If there's very little family history, everything seems fine, then you know that your family is likely at average risk. If on the other hand, there's a lot of cancer, it's very young, you can always come and have a chat with me. Um, getting into the public system, sometimes there's some delays, but they will see people, of course. Um, it's just a bit harder with the prostate. So um, you can certainly come and have a chat and then we can decide whether or not the cost of the genetic testing is the right way to go. Well, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, there's been some publicity lately about them taking some cells out, genetically modifying them and putting them back in and then they multiply and, and attack specifically the cancer cells. This, could you elaborate on that or? <laughs> so, uh, I won't in any big way tonight. No. Cancer genetics is more about the inherited genetic mistakes and the mistakes present in the cancers. But you're right, it leads to all sorts of different types of treatments. I am a medical oncologist, but I don't actually treat um, patients with cancer as such anymore. There are some excellent medical oncologists um, who work at the SAN and they are involved in those trials. So when a medicine is first um, found or thought of, it's tested on cells and to see does it work or not. Then it eventually gets tested in people and those trials you can enrol in. Um, they're usually um, 
quite small and they're really looking to see how the treatment works. Eventually you get the very big studies and that's where some of these treatments are at at the moment. They get published with their results and then you've got to convince the government that this is the treatment they should pay for. Once you get through that final hurdle, the med medications end up on the PBS and that's when they can be prescribed and basically your tax dollars pay for them. So in terms of what's available, the best person to talk to will always be the medical oncologist because they will know which trials are currently open, they'll know about your particular cancer and your particular circumstances, whether you meet those criteria. And also they can talk to you about the treatments that we now know work, because those studies have been done, but haven't yet been funded. And at that point, it's a discussion about how much does it cost? How well is it going to work? So those sorts of treatments where you use um, changes made to your own cells, they're usually white cells to attack, um, those sorts of treatments have been used in, in several different types of cancers. There are also, as we learn more about how cancer cells work, there are more targets that we find. So there's lots and lots and lots of treatments. I feel really sorry for the, the junior doctors who are coming in now because the words and the names are so complicated. But yes, rather than talk about them today, the best thing to do is if you're in a situation where um, the treatment that you've been using isn't working so well and you're looking for new treatments, the medical oncologist is the best person to, ha to help you with and there's a very big research centre um, at the SAN. Uh, is it, it, thank you. Uh, is it known whether um, a poisons or poor quality environment is likely to induce a, uh, an error in the gene or is that not yet known? So it's definitely known. In fact, with if you take smoking um, and sun exposure, those are the two classic environmental uh, toxins. Uh, in terms of smoking, if you look at lung cancers that come from smokers, you'll find spelling mistakes scattered throughout that library. Whereas a young person who never smoked, whose cell simply made a mistake, and then more mistakes built up, has a quite a, it's not really a clean cancer, but when you look at the genes, it's very different. So we know that what happens with tobacco smoke and the toxins that are in tobacco is that they cause the cells to make mistakes when they're dividing. And there are different ways they make those mistakes, but you can look for them and show them. When you think of sun damage, the reason that melanomas basal cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas develop is because those skin cells, as they were dividing and growing, were damaged by the radiation, the UV radiation, the ultraviolet light, um, ultraviolet radiation I should say, um, and as that happened they made a mistake. Now I can pretty much guarantee this is not how it happens, but I always imagine somebody a bit like a monk sitting down in a dark cave trying to write out a manuscript by hand and somebody's standing there poking them and annoying them and they make more and more and more mistakes. That's a bit like what these environmental toxins are. In terms of the well-known toxins, we've known about some of these for a long time. Diesel fuels, paint thinners, those sorts of things in high concentrations, which is why there's now rules around how you have to be when you're handling them. But in terms of general toxins, as in the pesticide that might be used growing fruits and vegetables, most of those, they have rules about safe levels. So is that the biggest risk factor? Probably not. We know, as I said, that 30% of cancers are caused through things like not exercising and not having a diet that's high in fresh fruits and vegetables, low in processed foods. So there's lots of information rather than just the toxins about lifestyle and we do have good information on that. Right, uh, what about living on a busy main road? So again, I think that's the same sort of thing when people ask about stress. Does stress cause cancer? Those sorts of questions. Part of that is if you look at everybody that lives on a busy road or everybody that for whatever reason has a big stressful thing, maybe they were involved in a bushfire and 
you know, the community lost their houses and people. If you look at those people, there's rarely a big increase in cancer in any way that we can really measure it. And I think that's because when you're stressed, you don't eat well, you don't exercise well, you don't sleep well, maybe you smoke more or drink more or whatever else. So there's a lot of other things that come into play. Plus, even if you do make more spelling mistakes, as I mentioned, where they land is random. And so if you look at everybody living on a busy road, some people might respond to that differently. Some people might balance it out with a healthy lifestyle, other people might not. It's very complicated to tease out. Ideally, we'd all live on lovely tropical islands and eat coconuts and have no stress, but I don't know. I think we probably end up with skin cancers instead. <laughs> I have a, something you said just earlier twigged something in my mind. If you've been involved in having radiation for prostate cancer, can that affect your genes? So it, it can and it does, and in fact that's how it works. Ah. So the cancer cells already have a lot of mistakes and the radiotherapy induces more. It's basically like if you think that you've got a program that tells you how to work, if you damage key parts of that program, it'll stop working. And so that's what radiotherapy is designed to do. Generally what happens is some of the healthy cells will be killed, or well, they can't go on and become a cancer because they're dead, and the healthy cells that aren't killed fix themselves. So they actually use their spell checkers and their grammar checkers to, to fix those mistakes. Oh, there are some very, very important genes where if there's a mistake in those genes that you've inherited, there's a syndrome called lee fraumeni syndrome, for example, where we just don't want any radiotherapy unless we have to. There's no point in saying well, we can't use radiotherapy today to treat your cancer in case you get a cancer in 20 years if you need the, the radiotherapy now. So in those, I'm thinking of breast again, but in those young women, we don't even want the low dose radiation that you get from having mammograms. Instead, we say bilateral mastectomies at 25. But that's a rare syndrome with a very high cancer risk. It's about 50% chance of having a cancer by the time you're 30 if you're female. Um, slightly less if you're male, but still very, very high cancer risks. Mm. So you're right, there's always, and it's the same with chemotherapy. We know that some of our chemotherapy can induce a leukemia 20 years down the track. It's very low, but that's also why when we look at a cancer, we say, well, do we really need the radiotherapy? Do we really need the chemotherapy? And when we use it, we use it because we're trying to make sure that the cancer is gone, never coming back, and that small risk is worth worth the the worth it on balance. And that's what that small risk is twenty years in the in the future. That's right. Oh, that's all right. That's <laughs> Now I'm always happy to talk to people and um, sometimes people say oh I really want to come and have a chat but you know I just don't have enough history. Telling somebody that they're average, that their friend, their um, kids, their relatives um, are also at average risk can be just as important as telling a family that they're at high risk and need extra screening. But the first stop should be your GP.